maybe if there's been this deal that delayed, maybe it can be easier. Yeah, no, no. I mean, but it somehow did away with the actual bounds. Okay, let's try this again. Uh, all right. Hopefully everybody can hear me this time. Uh, all right. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulullah. So, um, I was saying in this verse, explaining the significance of the noon with the shadda. La yabulu wannakum. This is used when you want to make a point, if you want to accentuate something, almost in some ways you like want to swear. And also Allah Ta'ala is saying without a doubt that Allah is going to give you a test. Bishayim in a sight. A sight we said is what? Hunting. Like hunting or gathering game. Is it tanaluhu aidiakum? So almost within reach of what? Be aidikum uh, of your hands. And this is important. Wa rimahukum as well as the spears or the implements, right? Literally spears, the things that you hunt with. This is important because uh, a side, we tend to think, I think, especially in the modern context, we think of hunting as something that you do like with a gun or uh, like a bow and arrow, always using an instrument uh, to do the hunting with. But here you could almost think of it as like hunting and gathering. Because Allah mentions first, Tanaluhu Aidikum, right? That's that which will be in reach of your hands. So there's a type of side or a type of gathering of things that are wild uh, with your hands. And then what? As well as that you use your spears or like your. Rimahukum means literally spears, but it also could be if you used a bow or any, again, any other kind of instrument. So this is going to be a great test for you to restrain yourself from uh, gathering food and hunting. Now you'll see why, because again, we tend to think in the modern context, hunting is something generally done as like a leisure. It's not something that's done for survival. It's something that you do, you know, maybe for fun. It's a leisure activity or if you're really super dedicated, like Imam Dawood, Imam Dawood Yasin, who has this whole like go get your own halal thing, right? That he does, and he he supplements what he eats uh, out of what he hunts. But again, for most of us in the modern context, we might read this ayah and find it a little odd that it's going to be a major test for you to not gather sustenance by way of what you can find with your hands or what you can kill, right, with spears. <laughs> to determine who is really sincere, who really fears Allah, right, unseen. Again, for us today, it seems like, well, what's a big deal not to go hunting? Fine, I just don't go hunting. No, we'll, as we'll see, the, uh, the, the, the idea of I mean, hunting and gathering uh, was a matter of survival, right? It's a, it's a major, major thing. That's why... Allah is saying, La Allahu min side, that Allah is going to test you a deed with something very difficult from that. And then, Whoever goes beyond that, or whoever um, flagrantly disregards that, then they will face an enormous punishment. And again, this is important because it's, it's to demonstrate how difficult of a thing uh, this would be again in the modern age when we want something to eat, we go to Trader Joe's, we go to a Tayyibat halal market, we go to Red Tomato, we go to Albertsons, we go to the store. Very simple and easy. But for the pre modern person, there was no supermarket, there was no 7 Eleven, there was no K Stop, there was nothing. And so you only had uh, what you could acquire by hand or by spear or bow. That was it. And so to be told that if you're going to be in a state of ihram, if you're going to be in a state of 
uh, sanctity to worship Allah to do things like Umrah or to make Hajj, then uh, you cannot take advantage while doing those things. And of course, this verse is important because it was revealed around the time of the Sulh al Hudaybiyah, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Anybody know what is significant? What was happening? Or where were the Muslims at when they were making this treaty between themselves and the Kufar, right? Between the people of Mecca and themselves. What was one of the major objectives that the Muslims wanted to get out of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah? Go to Umrah. They wanted to go to the Haram. Right? They wanted to go to the Haram and they wanted to make Umrah, the minor, the minor pilgrimage. So when you go to make Umrah, like just was when you go to make Hajj, what do you have to be in? A state of Ihram. So when you're in a state of Ihram, you are limited as to things you can do. Right? And so, uh, now imagine, these are people that have been all this time, right before the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, the Muslims were facing what? Well, boycott that resulted in what? Hunger, starvation, very, very difficult times. So if you're in this situation and you're no longer, because again, you, you've joined the Muslims, which meant that perhaps you might have left your tribe, so you don't have the support of the tribe. Already you have a sort of semi-nomadic people. You are not able to grow, you know, raise animals. You don't have any cattle. So you are food insecure. You are very, very food insecure. And so you, wherever you go, you're like, hey, look, man, by hand or spear or bow, I'm going to get whatever I can to eat because that's how we have to roll. That's how, that's how life is for us. And that's why Allah is saying, look, look, there's going to be this treaty. You're going to work out and hash out where, you know, you can come back and you can make umrah. Right, you can go to the haram, but understand that if you do that, if you if you have the intention to be in a state of ihram, you won't be able to hunt. So you and Allah is saying what that I'm going to test you is you're going to go into a state of ihram and then you're going to see this gazelle, you're going to see this deer, you're going to see eggs, right? And so that's the other thing here when Allah says what be be aidikum wa rimahukum. Going back to the verse, by your hands or your spears. So there was a tradition amongst, I mean, most hunter-gatherer people. There was a tr tradition amongst the, the, the semi-nomadic Arabs that, you know, they would take birds' eggs and they would obviously eat those as a form of, of sustenance. So even something as that, that counts as sayyid. Right? That counts as taking because it, there's a difference between you know, you're raising chickens and you go out in your coop and you take an egg. That's not sight. Right? That's not that's not hunting game. But wild birds that have eggs to go and acquire those, had a That's that's sight, right? That's hunting. So that's why it's it's a it's a significant thing uh, for us. And then we'll see how, like before with Bani Israel, that how Bani Israel was given a test about the Sabbath. And how that test became, uh, uh, it, it became a test for only some of them, but had implications for the rest, right? Uh, we'll, we'll see that going forward. So it kind of aside ahadu ma'ayish al Arab. So uh, as Shaukani says that what hunting and gathering by hand or by implementation or implements is is a, was a form of sustenance for the Arabs. Uh, and so then Allah Ta'ala, he what? Then he tested them by making uh, that impermissible. Again, dealing with the people that are food insecure. If you tell me right now, like even, even for us, like we have inshallah, uh, in about a week, the month of Ramadan will start. And you tell us you cannot drink any water between sunup and sundown, and you can't eat any food in, from sunup and sundown. You know, Okay, sure, I'm going to get a little thirsty. I'm going to get maybe a little hungry, but it's okay. Because at the end of the day, I've got all kinds of food in my fridge and, and whatnot. This is mujahada, but not necessarily ibtila. Like it's a struggle. And, and then you know, after a few days, most of us actually don't really have that big of a struggle in terms of the food and, and thirst part, the majority of us. 
we might have other issues throughout that time, right, of controlling the gaze and the anger and on and on. Those other things, right, but it's not. But for them, people living in a, in a, in a continuous state of food insecurity, this is why Allah describes it as ibtila, as, as, as a major test. So he says, فَإِبْتِلَهُمُ اللَّهُ بِجَحْرِيمِهِ So Allah is definitely giving them a, a test by making it impermissible to acquire any kind of sustenance through hunting and gathering uh, while in a state uh, of ihram, مَالْ إِحْرَامِ وَفِي الْحَرَمِ uh, As well as also while you're in the, 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 what you call like the sacred precinct of like the haram, either in Mecca or Medina, but all particular in Mecca, right? And this is a similar way in which Allah Ta'ala also tested the believers of Bani Israel from uh, much, uh, much uh, in the past from before. And la yatadu fis that they would not, uh, they, they would not infract this boundary. They would, they would not, uh, they would respect uh, this, this uh, prohibition that Allah had given them. وَكَانَ النُّزُولَ الْآيَةَ فِي عَامِ الْحُدَبِيَةِ And he says in that what, this, that this verse is coming down during the year in which the Muslims were negotiating the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah. أَحْرَمَ بَعْضُهُمْ وَبَعْضُهُمْ أَمْ لَمْ يُرْحَمْ يُحْرَمْ He said with that, that some of them entered into a state of ihram while others didn't. It means some were going to go make umrah and some didn't. فَكَانَ إِذَا عَرْضَ الصَّيْدِ اخْتَرَفَتْ فِيهِ أَحْوَالُهُمْ and so while, uh, therefore, when they encountered opportunities to hunt or to gather, right, their situations vary. So some scholars have debated uh, uh, about the intended audience of the verse. So who was it that was going to receive this difficult ibtila? who was going to receive this prohibition because not all of the Muslims were in a state of basically being wanderers. Like for instance, you had the Ansar in Medina. These were people that were generally settled, they had an establishment, they had resources. And so this is not necessarily an ibtila for them, a test for them. It's a test for some, but not for others, but it becomes a prohibition though, even though only some will be tested in that moment, it becomes... Uh, a prohibition and a hukum, right, for the entire ummah. So he says, وَقَدْ إِخْتَلَفَ عَلَى عُلَمَاءِ فِي مُخَاطِبِينِ بِهَذِهِ الْآيَةِ هَلْ هُمْ الْمُحِلُّونَ أَوْ الْمُحْرِمُونَ So were they allowed to hunt or were they prohibited from hunting? فَذَهَبَ إِلَى الْأَوَّلْ مَالِكْ وَإِلَى الثَّانِ إِبْنُ عَبَّاسِ So for instance, instance uh, Imam Malik, He's the one that took leans towards the, the former view that uh, they were uh, prohibited, right? Uh, and then uh, Ibn Abbas, right, took the latter position. He said, and then going on to the next one, Ya ayyuhal ladina amnu, la yubla wannakum allahu bi shay. Now, addressing that part at the beginning, uh, as Shaukani says, that another important point is that we will find that not everybody receives the same test or at the same time right so that allah will test some believers and not others or he will give essentially everybody in life will have their tests but not everybody has the same test and they don't all have it at the same time or at the same intensity so like what we see going on now in uganda or in sudan or in gaza right there are people in Yemen, right? There are people on this earth, you know, the Muslims in, in China. There are people on this earth that are going through an extremely difficult test, and some others are not. We're all being given a test, but because, uh, the, the, you know, the, what we need to understand is that we're always being tested, but that Allah Ta'ala, He chooses to give His test to whom He wants, in the way that He wants, when He wants, and in what intensity, right? And so, um, some people are filled with guilt. Oh man, I feel bad being here. I have wonderful things here. I have a good life here. And those Muslims over there, or this people over there, 
they're facing starvation and poverty. Yes, that is that is a that is an enormous bala. It's an enormous test from Allah Taala. That being said, one should not necessarily feel guilty because what is guilt? Guilt is a very bizarre. Uh, it's a very bizarre word and a very very bizarre emotion that is in many ways very strange to Islam. What we do have is nadam. We have remorse, you know, that I feel remorseful that I haven't been grateful enough to Allah. I don't worship him enough or that I was disobedient. I can have nadam. And that's why when the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, was questioned about tawbah, a man asked him, ma hiya at tawbah? He said, a nadam wa tawbah. What is tawbah? What is it to repent to Allah? What is it to turn back to him? He said, it is to have remorse. Then we also have shafaqah or rifq is to have compassion. So when we see people suffering, we shouldn't, we, shouldn't have, we shouldn't feel guilt because guilt also tends to be a very arresting and constraining emotion where things like compassion actually propel you to want to do something. So when you see people that are suffering, have compassion uh, and a sense of brotherhood, sisterhood, uh, that you should do something for them, right? And propel you to action. Not the sense of, oh man, I feel so bad about what I have, but then when I'm done feeling guilty, I just go on about my life and I don't give to charity, I don't help anybody, I don't get involved, right? So guilt is not really an emotion in Islam. You know, I grew up in a family where people used to joke about Catholic guilt, you know, um, but like really what is guilt? And, uh, you know, and again, in my opinion, guilt is a, it's an emotion that is very alien to, to Islam. So again, one of the things that Ashokani is showing us is that Allah, he, he, he gives everybody a test, but he doesn't give everyone the exact same test, nor does he give it at the same time or at the same intensity. So when you see other people suffering, don't think like, oh, like, wow, they're, su you know, they're having a test. And I'm not, you are also having a test. This is why I always remind people of the passage in Surah Al-Fajr. فَأَمَّا الْإِنسَانِ إِذَا مَبْتَلَاهُ رَبُّهُ when, and as for mankind as a whole, when his Lord tests them, when their Lord tests them, When he gives them good things, when he gives them things in their life that makes them happy, it's a test. It's an ibtila. But their response is, oh, look at how wonderful Allah has been to me. Rabbi akramani. وَأَمَّا إِذَا مَبَتَلَاهُ فَقَدَرَ عَلَيْهِ رزقه. But then when Allah Ta'ala says likewise with the same verb, when Allah gives them in another type of ibtila, وَقَدْرَ عَلَيْهِ رزقا, And constrains versus, you know, bestows, when He constrains some of their provision, then they say, you know, فَقَالَ رَبِّ أَهَانَنِي Oh, Allah has humiliated me. No, both of them are a test. So when you see somebody going through a particular kind of test, let's say that is in... Uh, for lack of a better word, in the negative, in loss, they're 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 hungry, uh, they're they're afflicted by war, disease, whatever that it is, and that's why I'd say in the negative, it's ibtila. Your feeling should not be of guilt. Your feeling should the first thing is to go to, oh man, I I'm not getting that. That's a test because, am I using that? Am I thanking Allah? Am I praising Him? Am I repenting for my sins? Am I giving to charity? Am I helping the poor? Am I doing these things? It's at, the test is always going on at the same time, but the perception, and this is the issue with human beings, is our perception is easily fooled. We're, especially when it's pleasant, right? When it's like when it's a pleasant experience, we will be fooled into thinking, oh, uh, these are blessings from Allah, Allah is pleased with me, uh, I've basically have won. No, you are always being tested. So just a reminder about that. So they're being tested as some of the Muslims, again, that were separated from their tribe, they're in the state of kind of wandering, they're been boycotted, 
They're facing continuous starvation and food deprivation, food insecurity. And so as they're going about their life, they're getting whatever they can get hand or bow or hand and, and spear, like whatever opportunity they are constantly acquiring sustenance because they don't know where the next meal is coming from. And so Allah is saying that, look, when it comes to this type of ibadah, the ibadah where you have to be in a state of ihram, I'm going to test you. You're going to see some things that will be an opportunity. And so you're going to have to make a choice. Am I going to feed my gullet? And again, if you're making Umrah, especially Umrah, I mean, you're only going to be doing it for a couple of hours, maybe. But at that moment, you may see an opportunity presented to you. Will you defer your gratification of dunya for akhirah and continue to stay in that state of ihram? Or would you impract it? So again, not everybody's being tested like this, but it's a test that even though it's for some, it's a lesson for the entirety to learn. It's a lesson for the, the entirety of the believers to learn. And so he continues, Rahimullah uh, al he says, وَالْرَاجِحْ أَنَّ الْخِطَابْ لِلْجَمِيعِ So he says that the stronger opinion, interpretation, is that th this address that Allah is giving, it's to the general, even though the generality of the ummah, even though it is only going to be in that moment, it's going to impact uh, a few uh, a few individuals. Uh, and so, the, and the, there's no reason to limit uh, because it's affecting some individuals and not others, and then limit what's only applies to them. No, the stronger opinion, obviously, about the prohibition about hunting and gathering while. Uh, in the state of ihram applies to the whole. Again, for most of us today, you know, unless you actually like live right there in Mecca or Medina today, you know, uh, it's very unlikely that we will uh, face this challenge. Or even if we go over there and make Umrah or Hajj, it's very unlikely that we will be hunting or gathering while we're there. But nonetheless, this is an important lesson about when you commit yourself to Allah, you're committing yourself to Akhirah, and that means undoubtedly at some point along the journey you will lose things of this life or opportunities of this life may pass you not all of them but maybe some of them and be prepared to deal with that and keep your eye on the prize focus on right what is important woman uh, uh, woman uh, uh, and as it relates to the particular inflection in the verse, min aside or a portion of hunting and gathering, li tabi'id wa huwa sa'id al bar. Right? So he said that as for the phrase hunting game, it could be something specific referring to the game of like animals that are like on the land, right? Sa'id uh, al bar. And he called who Ibn Jarir al Tabari wa ghayruhu. And this was. The opinion of people uh, like uh, Imam Al Tabari, Rahimullah, and other scholars, but then also Waqila, an alternative, the Min in middle side, Bayani Yadun Aishayun Haqir middle side. Some others have said that this is used as a general sense, indicating something insignificant, right? Something small. So. Uh, uh, minasai doesn't mean hunting, in, in, but maybe some small opportunity. And so he's he's letting us know that even though this isn't the dominant opinion, this other opinion is there to flesh out. As we said, what that if it happens to mean that, if we take that or we consider that meaning that minasai means well, you know, small things that you might come along. It's also the lesson that what what when you're in a state of ihram, you're doing like ibadah kabir, you're doing major ibadah. Like when you're doing Hajj or Umrah, you're in a state of Ihram, you're making Tawaf. This is a this is a major, major ibadah. Don't allow little dunya opportunities to rob you of major akhiriya opportunities. Don't allow little opportunities of this life, or in some ways, opportunities of this life pale in comparisons to worship Allah that will give dividends in the hereafter. So he's, he's mentioning these things so that we will have a greater appreciation of some of the subtleties of the language. And so he's giving us 
uh, some of these uh, some of these opinions. So he says, "I shayun haqir, right middle side, wa tankir shayun litahqir." That his statement within reach of your spears. He said this emphasizes the accessibility of of, of whether you know the, the accessibility to food sustenance by way of hand or by way of some hunting implement. Uh, and this is Qara ibn uh, Wathab. Now, one of the Qura, one of the reciters of the Quran, is mentioned that you can also recite this verse in another way. Instead of uh, uh, that is almost within reach of your hands, it can also be read as but it's in the significance here of changing the ya for the ta. Number one, this has to do with the rasam of the Quran. Do you guys remember, this is a little while ago, but I had mentioned this thing called the rasam of the Qur'an. What is the rasam? Right, the rasam, when you look at the Qur'an, um, right, when you look at the Qur'an, you will notice that the way the letters are written, especially letters like ya, ta, tha, um, ba, uh, noon, Right. What are the differences between these letters, whether the dot is above or below? So like a ya and a ta, the difference is between two dots above and two dots below. The difference between uh, a ta and a noon is two dots above and one dot above. Um, and so the original way that the Qur'an was written by the Arabs, uh, and this is important how we get the variations and how the Qur'an can be recited, is that they were just written like the sort of curly cues without the dots. The dots came later because people that were not really like of Bedouin extraction or really the 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 sort of pure out of extraction, they didn't they didn't they, they couldn't read that and, and they wouldn't be able to know. Oh, that's definitely a yeah or a ta or it could be they know which one it could be. So then, as the writing system developed, they would put the dots so that people would make it easier for people that didn't grow up with the language like that so that they would know. So nowadays when we see it, that's what we all, this yeah is two dots below and ta is two dots above. And so you can sometimes read them in different ways. One, and there's a whole set of rules and I won't, I won't go on too long of a tangent, but you can, change, you can change the way a thing can be read. First off, if it has a senate, if it has a chain going back to the Prophet Sallallahu that it could be done so, right? Uh, or if we can, take it back to some of the Sahaba that they read it so. Secondly, it has to make grammatical sense, right? It means it has to be something permissible to make that change that grammatically it makes sense. And then third, it has to make sense in terms of ma'ani or aqidah. It has to make sense in terms of meaning. So if you, take a, you take a verse in the Quran where Allah says, يُفَصِّلُ ayatihi," That he explains his verses. So you fasilu, he explains his verses, can also be read as nufasilu ayatihi, and we explain his verses. The meaning is the same. As we say, al-ma'na wahid, the meaning is all the same. The inflection is between Allah speaking in the royal we, we explain versus he explain, he mean Allah explains. Who is explaining? Allah. But it can be expressed in as a we or as a he. It could never be expressed as what? Well, you can you can't change a, a, a the, the, you can't change this to this. You can't change that which could be like say a ya yeah or a ta to an alif. So obviously that goes out. But you can not also understand it as to fasilu ayatihi, right? That you explain our verses. Well, who's you? No other human being could do that. Or to uh, fasilu, uh, she explains. No, because Allah never refers to Himself through any feminine pronouns, only through masculine pronouns. So there are rules based upon transmission, grammar, and meaning that all have to be. And this is a much greater topic. But He mentions this here to give us again why another 
insight. So he says, this is what هَذِهِ الْجُمْلَ تَقْتَضِي تَعْمِيمِ الصَّيْدِ You can read it this way that provides a, it, it, it provides a generalization of game. So if you read it as يَنَالُهُ يُنَالُهُ الصَّيْدِ But if you read it as تَنَالُهُ is تَنَالُهُ what الْيَدِ If you read it as with the ya, it refers to that the game is also almost within reach. But if you read it as the ta, then it's within reach of your hands. But it's the meaning is all what about what you're going to gather. So it's but what أَنَّهُ لَا فَرْقَ بَيْنَ مَا يُؤْخَذُ بِالْيَدِ Right? Is it indicating that there's no distinction between what is captured by the hand, such as a young game or something you could catch with your hands, or eggs, right? وَهُوَ مَا لَا يُطِيقُ الْفِرَارْ كَالْصِغَارْ وَالْبَيْضِ So whether you're, doing, whether you're talking about game in general or what you can acquire with your hand, this is, to, this is, this is a, one variant reading just to emphasize that you're going to have to... Don't think that it's limited to just major game or what you're going to use your bow or your arrow or your spear to get, but even... Right, even with your hand, or that just in game in general, you're going to have to, while you're in a state of ihram, forego the dunya. Right, and so this again, while only applying to a small group of believers, it's a lesson for the entire ummah that when you have opportunities to worship, that is going to, without a doubt, come potentially that there might be an opportunity presented to you. I, imagine, you know, I remember. A couple of years ago, we were somebody was saying like, "How how is this practical?" I said, "Okay, if we extract from this uh, a particular example, I said, imagine you're praying. When you pray, you make takbir of what? Takbir al ihram. You go into a state of ihram. When you're in a state of ihram, what you can only do the prayer. Otherwise, you invalidate your prayer. Like you can't like, you know, start doing your taxes and you know cooking and you know checking your Instagram and no, like you're in a state of ihram. You can only do that." That being said, imagine your phone rings and you have you have it you have it there. And let's say like you were just having a conversation with somebody about making a trade or something. Oh, right? And then you know you're going to talk to that person again because maybe there's some opportunity. And you're praying and your phone starts flashing and you see it's that person. Do you stop your prayer to deal with a dunya we thing? Or are you in a state of ihram and you realize, you know what, let me, let me finish my prayer because this few moments of ibadah is worth anything that's going to come from this dunya. So just, just you know, again, extrapolating from that a lesson about ibadah is its own thing and that whatever you might miss in a temporary act of ibadah is inconsequential to the reward that you will get that will be everlasting. I think you had a question. Can you um, elaborate or go into the meaning of ihram? So, the ihram is the masdar or the verbal noun of ahrama. And as I've said before, ahrama buniya ala al wazn af'ala. For those of you that were in my Arabic class, right, this form in sarf or morphology, af'ala, is the it is the transformative state. It's the same, uh, the same morphological structure we use for like aslama to become a Muslim, or ahsana to be a muhsan, a person of ihsan. So ihram, Islam, ihsan, iman. These are all built on the same form that are to transform into being in a state, right? To being in a particular state. And so you are in the state of hurm. When a thing is, when a thing has hurma, as we said two weeks ago in the khutbah, what does Allah, what does the Prophet say, how does he describe the haram, the haramat, those things that Allah has prohibited, uh, usury, pork, fornication, uh, wine. He's, these are the haramat, these are the things that Allah has prohibited. How did the Prophet وسلم, describe those things? Hima Allah. They are Allah's private sanctuary that we don't have the 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 idhan, we don't have the permission to enter into. 
So when you are in a state of ihram, you have permission to do some things and permission to and, and lack of permission to do others. The only permission you have to do in a state of ihram is ibadah. As it relates to what that act of ibadah is. So like if you're making tawaf, tawaf is different than salah. Right? Obviously, tawaf involves movement. You're walking around. You cannot walk around. If you walk around while you make salah, you're not making salah. Your salah is invalid. But both require you to be in a state of ihram. So it's a state of which you have hurma, or you have to have a certain level of ihtiram, a level of respect for that thing that you're engaged in. So it's hal al ihtiram ala shay. It's a level of respect for that thing and you give it a, a moment of dedication of which you disregard other things. So it's about being in a state. That's why we call it takbiratul ihtiram or takbiratul ihram. We call it going and making the takbir of being in the state of hurma. You're in a sacred state. And in that state, only the salah wa harakatuhu right only its statements and its movements are permissible everything outside of that is impermissible otherwise it is better it is no longer sound so that that that's the the meaning of ihram is to be in a state just like to be a muslim is in a state it's a state of what la ilaha illallah yes so Fix the state. But sometimes we have to fix the state. You got to fix the prayer. Uh, yes, this will be uh, maybe intent. That's something you have to judge. But just the example, like the phone was ringing, might be an opportunity. But it's not stopped. It's not ringing. It's a weak example. But let me just turn this off. We just turn that off. Yeah, I mean, like you, like, like this happens. Like you're praying. Oh man, I forgot to turn my phone off, and it starts ringing. And you know, you can press that that don't disturb button. Okay, fine. That I mean, that's not uh, yeah. that's not the responding to the point where you are in front. Okay, fine. You you hit it so that you don't disturb others and break your. Okay, that's different versus you know. Sami Allahu Niman Hamida Rabbana Lak Alhamd. Hey man, I'll call you right back. Yeah. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> well, <laughs> can we get this from Aisha, right? She right, right. The prayer and literally opened the door so people can see she was. Praying, yes, right? yes, yes. And actually, you know, the the this will surprise some people, but actually, you can return the salam, right? So you can be praying, and a person can say Assalamu Alaikum. You can return the salam. That's what I'm saying. There are certain, when you're in a state of ihram, there are things that are permissible and a set of those, and then everything else outside of that is impermissible. But if you're like, Sami Allah, Huni bin Hamida, who dis? I'll get right back to you. Rabbana, <laughs> that, that doesn't count, right? Uh, you know, responding to the salam is different than who dis. Right? So, you got to, you know, obviously that's why it's important to study fiqh so that you know when you're in the state of ihram, what is permissible and what is not permissible, right? And so he mentions this, right? So, you know, just he, he mentions this difference in the qira'ah uh, just so that we can, again, appreciate overall uh, the, 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 the sanctity and the ta'zim, like the enormity of being in ihram. Right, he's giving us all of these little insights here for that. Now the 95th verse. Bismillah. <coughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman Ya ayyuhal ladina amru, la taqtaru sayd. Now, oh, again, oh you who believe. He's, he's, he's not telling the disbelievers not to do this. He's telling the believers to do this, right? So also understanding that when it comes to all of the ahkam of Allah, many of the, many of the hukum, many of the commands that Allah gives are actually for the believers so that we know how to believe. When people come and say, I don't believe in organized religion, then what you, what you really are saying is, I don't believe that Allah has the right to tell me how to worship. I don't believe God has a right to set the rules and boundaries and methods of how 
I worship him, but rather he should take whatever I want and feel like giving to him in whatever way I, 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 uh, whatever way I choose. So when people talk about they don't believe in organized religion, what they really means is that they just believe in their own nafs. So again, we have a hukum. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu. La taqtaru aside. Do not kill game intentionally. Wa antum hurum. That's why I said hurum. What is ihram? You're in a state of hurum. Hurma, right? You're in a state of sanctity, right? Wa antum hurum. So if you say a rajul haram, right? Fil mufrad, fal jama hurum. So like you say, uh, that man. He's haram, meaning he's in a state of haram, uh, of ihram. But when you do want to talk about the the group, then the the word changes in the in the plural to haram. Well, that's yeah, yeah, exactly. Because when you because again, what is masjid haram is different than all other masajid, right? And of course, we have the haramain. But I'm saying. When you go to the Kaaba, right? I mean, one more one. That's the only masjid in the world that has the Kaaba, right? That's why it's a very unique place, and it has it has uh, blessings of, that are associated with it. And that when you go there, you're literally even if you go there and you don't make Umrah, still you're at you're in in the masjid that has what Beit Allah. You're in the masjid that has the house of Allah in it. And so when you're there, even more so than any other masjid, you should be in a mindset of ihram, even if not in a state of ihram, because what? You're at Allah's house. So, lahu, right? Talking in a bad way, doing things that are frivolous, those all things should be put aside. Now, like what? I, I'm, I'm in masjid al-haram. I'm, I'm in the place that even if I'm not making tawaf, I should be what? I should be like with those that are in a state of in a state of ihram. Right? So that's why again the Prophet gives such a beautiful description. We say haram like a thing, and it's true. There are some things that are haram, Allah Himself describes as rajis. They are they are impurities and they are filthy. But also he broadens that to understand you don't have any right to it. Those are the private pasture of Allah Ta'ala. And you don't have any right to it. Right? So that helps to flesh out our understanding. And says, وَمَنْ قَطْرَهُ مِنْكُمْ مُتَعَمِّدًا And then whoever amongst you does hunt and, and does so intentionally فَجَزَاءُ مِثْلُ مَا قَطْرَ مِنَ النِّعَمِ Then you have to make up for this right by offering its 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 uh, equivalence right and that it is what uh, that, that 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 is going to be uh, uh equal to what it was that you got and then also uh or by feeding some 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 people feeding the needy what the adlan minkum so what you can't just even even when you're going to offer what was given, that has to be determined by somebody else so that well, there's no personal bias involved. So let's say, you know, in this case, you were in a state of ihram, but you just saw this like amazing giant elk, gazelle, whatever, boom, you did it, you know it was wrong, but I just couldn't let this opportunity pass up. And now I'm going to atone to Allah by giving them a couple of quail eggs. <laughs> no, no, no. You got to give the equivalent as judged by two men uh, who are just uh, to do so. Or by what? Uh, or you have to uh, give some sort of kafara uh, uh, of ta'amu uh, miskin, right? You have to uh, uh, feed some poor people. Again, right, in the way that you would feed yourself, right? So if you, if you eat well, when you go to feed poor people, you got to feed them well. What you would give yourself and your family, don't give them right the table scraps. Uh, or you would have to fast, uh, you know, as as a means of uh, of doing so. For what purpose? 
so that you taste the consequences of what you did. So this is another important thing. We may never ever, you know, we may never have this opportunity to experience this exact thing that Allah Ta'ala is talking about. But what is he ultimately saying? Like, look, take advantage also. Or one of the things we could, if we want to extrapolate the specific to a generality that we can apply in our life. Take advantage of opportunities to worship Allah. Take advantages to turn back to Him. Uh, when you give, give well. Give what you can and give well. Fast and do these things. And take it, and, 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 and as Allah Ta'ala, when He talks about making tawbah, He says, what tawbah is istighfar and islah. Right? We turn back to Allah and repent. We ask for for His giving, but we also we try to rectify what we did wrong or our affairs, taking responsibility of that. So that we are conscious and take responsibility of what we do, as he said, what liyadulka wa bala amrihi, so that you can taste the consequence of the violations that you made. So what your heart is affected, so you turn back to Allah. He says, "Afallahu amma salaf," and so when that is done, Allah will then forgive what has transpired, right? What has happened in the past. Right, but as for those, well, men ada, but for those who continue to persist, then Allah will Allah will not just you know hear the, the, the English translation, those who persist will be punished by Allah. This is not sufficient in the description. And I left this I left it this way on purpose because I wanted to address this because look at what Allah says. فَيَنْتَقِمُ intiqam. What is intiqam? Do you know one of Allah's names is Al-Muntaqim? What is Al-Muntaqim? Yes, the one who avenges a wrong. Imagine doing something in life that was wrong. You transgressed into Allah's private area. And then you didn't seek to make amends and you kept going again and again into the area. Allah takes everything personally. Takes an account of everything. There is a hisab for everything. And there are some transgressions that Allah will come after a person to exact a, a, a revenge upon. Meaning that it's not just simply going to be punished. And that's why here they, they use the word punished, but Allah will actively seek revenge upon that person for that transgression. So that's a major, major thing. And of course, what is this? What, what, what can we take from the Wallahu Azizun Dul Intiqam? Allah is powerful and is the one who is capable of, of, of that kind of. And Allah is the one who is the one who, 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 who does take revenge on people. I know that that word might seem surprising for some people. But we have to understand that there is not, not all sins are the same. Even Allah says in the Quran, like, you know, if you swear an oath and it's you know, something, we, we won't take you account to this, but you make a major oath and then you violate that, well, same thing. You got to fast or give some type of kafara. I mean, you got to do something major Otherwise, you will face a, a severe punishment for that. So there's some things that are minor, lemon, and there's some things that are major. And all of this is to engender what? Man khashya rahman bil ghaib. The one that fears the most merciful. Unseen. Meaning that if I fear Allah, if I make a major transgression, I take responsibility, I avoid it, I repent, uh, I try to uh, set the affairs straight. Allah If I do that, then inshallah, for those small things or things that I forgot, whatever, then Allah is Ar Rahman. Allah is infinitely merciful. But let me at least demonstrate and make myself uh, avail myself of Allah, beseech Him to, on those things that I know that were major, I take responsibility for them and for those other things I throw myself on his mercy but not to take them right 
not to take them lightly at all. As for the part, وَمَنْ قَطَّرَهُ مِنْكُمْ مُتَعَمِّدًا He says, then, you know, whoever kills game intentionally, right? This particular term, uh, mutaammid. Let me fix my notes here because I always, I'm the king of typos. Term, right? Whoever does that. Then, huwa al-qasid li shay. This refers to the one who, ha- who has the intentionality. Or who intentionally seeks something with knowledge right? that knows that they, they know that they have no right to do it they know that it's something that is sacrosanct and yet they still intentionally do it so that is what the meaning of muta'amid is in the verse he says right? huwa and then also the term al mukhti'u So mukhti'u from khata. What's the word khata in Arabic? Khata means mistake. But it can also mean a sin. Right? It can mean like in, in common speech, khata uh, is a mistake. But more often in the Quran, khata means like a sinful error of judgment or mistake, something that has to be atoned for. So what al mukhti'u who alladhi yaqsidu shay'an. And so likewise, that is the one who aims for something and in the process accidentally captures some gain. So you're doing something and somehow you come across it. That's one type. And then what? Anasi from Nasa to forget. And then the one who does intentionally hunt because they forgot about, maybe they forgot about the verse or they forgot about it and they do so. And that's why most of a great majority of the scholars believe that's why whether it's intentional or otherwise, it's something that has to be uh, it has to be accounted for. فَقَدْ إِسْتَدَلَّ إِبْنُ عَبَّاسِ وَأَحْمَدْ فِي الرِّوَايَةِ And so Ibn Abbas and Imam Ahmed, rahimahumah Allah, may Allah have mercy on both of them, uh, uh, as well as Dawood. Right, they 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 limited the meaning of this verse as he says what bi ikhtisarihi subhanahu ala al amid bi annahu la kafarza ala ghairihi. They limited to those only that were in an intentional violator and not the others. That was the opinion of Ibn Abbas, Ahmed, and others. Uh, they limited to that alone. Bal la tajibu illa alayhi wahda. And so it, it wouldn't fall upon the person that did it accidentally or they did it intentionally, but they forgot. It only applies to the intentional violator that both they knew what they're doing, they had knowledge of it, and they, and they did so. Uh, and so he said, and this is, وَبِهِ قَالَ سَعِيد إِبْنُ جُبَيْرْ وَطَاوُسْ وَإِبْنُ ثَوْرْ And this was the opinion of some other uh, major uh, companions or, 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 or scholars. And then he says, Waqila, it has also been said, and, and as we said before, when you when you're reading in a book of fiqh, or reading in a book of tafsir, when the scholar says qila, he's saying, look, this is something that's also said. It is, however, not what I agree with and what I deem to not be the stronger opinion. But since this is studying, we need to know what, you know, we need to know all opinions. So when you see qila, it's not the dominant opinion, but it, it's still important for the broader understanding. So he says, وَقِيلَ إِنَّهَا تَلْزَمُ الْكَفَّارَ الْمُقْطِئُ وَالنَّاسِيَ كَمَا تَلْزَمُ الْمُتَعَمِّدِ So he said, it has been said that doing some type of expiation, a kafara is obligatory for everybody, intentional, non-intentional, otherwise, uh, just as it is for the one that is intentional. Uh, so this is distinct from the other prevailing opinions. However, this opinion has been reported by Wal Ruya and Omar Wal Hassan Yani Hassan al Bari. So Omar ibn al Khattab, Al Hassan al Basri, Wal Nakhi, Wal Zuhri, Wabihi Qala Malik. And so then that was the opinion of some of the companions. And then from the imams that came after the opinions, the companions that support that opinion is, for instance, 
Imam Malik, Imam Shafi'i, uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, wa ashabuhum, as well as their followers and their students, wa ruya an Ibn Abbas, and it is also attributed to Ibn Abbas. So this should not be something that we uh, get down in some get down in the dirt and fight with each other about. This is a legitimate difference of opinion that we find in the understanding of both the companions uh, and and the, and the imams that came after. وَقِيلَ أَنَّهُ يَجِبُ التَّكْفِيرَ عَلَى الْعَادِ النَّاسِ Another opinion is that expiation is obligatory for the unintentional and the forgetful violator. Uh, because they they still violated this the the the, the sanctity of 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 not hunting right so they they did that well mujahid and so for instance mujahid uh one of the great uh scholars of uh, of the narration of the the, the 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 reports of the sahaba and whatnot this was his opinion uh, he said, according to Majahid, if the violator is aware of this, then not only does his state of ihram become nullified, right? Just like if you're in salah, it becomes nullified. Then it's that he's no longer in a state of ihram. So if he was doing umrah or whatever, then that's no longer valid. Or if he was making hajj, then the thing is no longer valid. He says, Kamala utakallama. He says, Fabatara alihi kamala utakallama fi salati aw ahtatha fiha. Just like in the same way that if you spoke during prayer or you introduce some type of new movement into prayer that is not what the Prophet taught, then like how the prayer would become invalid, then your umrah and your hajj would become invalid. So he leaves that there uh, as, a, as a reminder for us. But, you know, I was thinking, put that in context for the people who have never done that, you know, there is a great distance once you get into the state of the Quran. There's a point, right? Where, right. You know, you, you make a do and you, you put your gear on. And you're on a bus, and once you get into Mecca, so you're already in this state. So I was just thinking, like, well, even though you're on a bus, like, how would you... Well, what if the bus broke down? You got stuck. I don't know. What, some weird scenario. Right. And I got to eat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is this, yeah, point. There is a legitimate, I mean, things yeah. could happen where, you know. And especially back in the day, we didn't have that. Yeah. Where, like, people, they had a necessity. You know, again, there was no supermarket. There was no 7-Eleven. There was no Whole Foods. There was, you know, like, obviously, this is probably going to as a tatbiq, as a practical application, we'll refer more to the people from the past and it probably will impact us today. But the general lesson about, uh, you know, giving ibadah its due and when you're in that state, you know, it's like to have khushu'ah. You know, it's like to really have that focus and that intentionality and give it its due and not be distracted by uh, the dunya, right? So we, we, can, we can take from that even though the vast majority of us will never be in a state where we're going to go on hajj and go hunting at the same time or or need to hunt while like i've got my ihram on but man i can really use a steak hey look over there you know <laughs> like that's not probably going to 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 happen for the vast majority of us but rather the 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 generalities and the application is what ibadah is something special and when you are in ibadah uh, a state of worship, then give it its due. And even though they're really talking about ihram as it relates to like hajj and umrah, but we also are in ihram when we make salah, which is going to be the far more common ihram, state of ihram for the vast majority of us, which means that what? When you pray, be focused. Leave behind the issues of the dunya when you pray. To the best of your ability. That's why the Prophet ﷺ says what? A person gets the reward of the prayer of what they took from it. But when you begin to play with your clothes and scratching at your beard and this and this and that, and that will happen. Like, you'll be fine. You know, like, you know, you'll be fine, man. All of a sudden, oh, yeah, I got to pray through her. Allahu Akbar, you're in the prayer. And all of a sudden, like, man, like, did I come down with like a sudden case of eczema? Like, your whole skin starts crawling and all the damn my back and this and this. Like, you know, and 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 that's obviously some influence from the shayateen, right? Uh 
And so that's why you have to, part of that ignoring the world isn't just your broker on the phone, right? But those little things too, because everything that distracts you from your prayer, you're losing some, some blessings and reward of doing it. So you want to maximize as much as you possibly can. Uh, fight all, like, okay, my head is itching. All right, I don't have to respond to it. I know it's just like, you know, the phone is, even if you had the phone on silent, but you see the light flashing, I don't, I don't have to respond to it, right? I can just let it go, right? Um, so those are just some of the, the generalities that we can extract, uh, even though the ayah is revealed to a certain group of people in a very specific set of circumstances, but uh, the reminder and the benefit uh, inshallah for us is to apply this to uh, other areas in our life in which we will be in the state of sanctity or the state of ihram yes so, so in regards to the salat uh, the tafsir ihram is that terminology is that something that we inherit from the prophet or is that something that we inherit from his companion salat shafi so the, the Prophet Sallallahu has described the to to make the 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 takbirah right in the beginning right and so yes for we we get that from the from the Prophet Sallallahu and also from uh, from the companions yeah what is it called the uh, like in the like Ramadan the last ten nights you stay. Yeah, uh, that's kind of like a similar instance. Right, like so, like i'tikaf. Like if you go to the masjid and you're going to make i'tikaf, you're going to stay in in the masjid, right? It's not that the it's kind of like a a lesser ihram, if you want to call it that, right? In that there's certain things you can do and certain things you can't do. Now. Like when you like when you're when you're making salah, you just can't have a conversation, right? Now, when you're making i'tikaf, you shouldn't talk unless it's for a need, right? It should really about being like in a, you know dhikr and ibadah, like in the remembrance of Allah and worship and whatnot. I mean, if you have to communicate with somebody, okay, fine, it's not like a complete violation, but you shouldn't just be like in the masjid, you know, playing some backgammon and uh, just chopping it up, that's not i'tikaf. So it, it has a similarity to ihram, but ihram is above that. Um, now imagine being in i'tikaf and then being in a state of ihram like when you pray. Right, that would be even more so, right? Um, but yeah, there's there's a kind of similarity to i'tikaf because what i'tikaf is you're withdrawing from the world to devote yourself purely to the remembrance and the worship of Allah. Yeah. yeah. There's no, there's no, there's no punishment. Yeah, yeah. I just you might have to leave. I mean, you could actually leave, go to work, and come back. Right, right. It's about the intentionality and those things. Again, there are things that you're limited to um but it's not uh it's not exactly the same as ihram but there 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 is a similarity between them yeah any other questions oh, i think the people online were good so um we'll be back one more time uh next week before ramadan so next week inshallah will be our last weekend classes cuz we'll put those on hold during the month of ramadan uh, we'll have some other things going on during the month of Ramadan, but the weekend classes will be on. So next week will be our last one, and then uh, inshallah we'll, we'll be here uh, every day for Salah at Tarawih, inshallah, in the evening, obviously Isha, uh, Maghrib Isha, as well as in the evening. So we'll also go over uh, and perhaps share some more insights on, on those during the, uh, the khatir or the talks that we give during the month of Ramadan. May Allah Ta'ala accept from us wa zidna ilman. May Allah Ta'ala increase us in knowledge. And may Allah Ta'ala make us from amongst those who they have the taqashya'u fi salawatihim, those that have that reverence in their prayer when they are praying. Wa salawatuhu wa salamuhu ala nabihi al-kareem wa ala alihi wa ashabihi.
اجمعین والحمد للہ رب العالمین